welcome everybody to RAG this evening. Um, and we're really uh, very happy to have Matthew Doyle with us to talk about his work on indigenous local politics and the Bol Bolivian movement for socialism. He is currently associate lecturing on next year at UCL, which we're very glad to hear about. Okay, Matthew, please let's uh, go on. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Camilla. Um, so just to introduce myself to those of you who, who don't already know me, uh, my name is Matthew Doyle. I work as a lecturer in the department at UCL. I'm a social anthropologist, uh, but I'm also a sort of long term occasional participant in RAG. And I sort of have gone long over the years to a lot of RAG talks. And I think I gave a talk about five, six years ago when I was um, just back from my field work doing my PhD at the University of Sussex. And this is a talk which is based really on the fieldwork that I did during my PhD. And it's the argument for a book that I'm writing at the moment, which I hope will be coming out probably not next year, but the following year. And so it's still a sort of work in progress. Uh, but hopefully, you know, maybe if, if you feel you would like to get in touch with me to give me any feedback uh, or so we can have a chat, of course, after the talk, please, please feel free. Uh, I've included my email address here. Uh, and so we're going to be talking today about decolonizing the state, indigenous local politics and the Bolivian movement for socialism. So just to very briefly introduce my research, uh, as I said, I'm a social anthropologist, but uh, very much a kind of political anthropologist. So my, my research focuses on processes of state reform, uh, local politics and um, uh, local politics and, and, and legal anthropology or socio-legal studies. I studied an indigenous community in Bolivia and its interaction with a new reformist state under the movement for socialism or mass uh, party. And uh, this community known as Kirkiawi is distinguished by having multiple overlapping forms of local political authority and also by double residence. So while families within the community may live some of the time or predominantly in nearby cities of Oruro and Cochabamba in peri-urban neighbourhoods, they maintain ties of kinship and economic, economic reciprocity with their home villages. And I carried out 18 months of multi-sited field work. I spent time uh, in this region, uh, in, in this area of Kirkiawi. I got to know people. I attended local political meetings. I went on a cycle of different local political meetings. I interviewed local uh, political leaders. And I also followed them to meetings in, uh, uh, in Oruro, in Sucre, in La Paz, in Cochabamba, uh, meetings of the Constitutional Court, NGOs, indigenous rights groups, and so on. And I also spent time in nearby cities in peri-urban neighbourhoods amongst rural urban migrants and would sometimes travel back uh, between the city of Cochabamba and this uh, community of Kirkiawi. So just to put this talk into some sort of overall context, as I'm sure many of you already know, the national government uh, currently in power in Bolivia is the Movement for Socialism Party or MAS. And this is considered amongst the more radical end of the pink tide of democratically elected left reformist Latin American administrations. So for, for those who are not familiar with this concept of the pink tide, this has to be understood in the context of at least the last 50 or 60 years of politics in Latin America. So the kind of traditional mid 20th century Latin American left was very influenced by Marxist ideas kind of revolutionary ideas of Marxism and Maoism, influenced by things like the, the Cuban Revolution, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro. And uh, a lot of the, the Latin American left was extra parliamentary, so it operated outside of formal political structures and worked towards revolution. There were kind of various revolutionary guerrilla movements throughout Latin America. Now, during the 1970s, there was a period of repression of the left in Latin America, and many Latin American countries uh, underwent periods of military dictatorship, very repressive military dictatorships, which were often tacitly or even overtly supported by the United States government and the CIA. And then after the end of the 1970s, the, in the early 1980s, you saw this historic return of democracy, this new wave of democratization, as political scientists sometimes refer to it, throughout Latin America. 
And yet the governments that were in power throughout the 1980s and the 1990s were very much centrist or centre-right political parties that carried out so-called neoliberal economic restructuring. So following the recommendations of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, these governments massively cut public spending, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they reduced social spending, uh, partic uh, on, on, particularly on things like education, healthcare, and so on. And this was a period of historic defeat for the left in Latin America, as it was, in fact, for, I, I would say, the left in, in pretty much most of the world in, in the 1980s, 1990s. It was the sort of high point of neoliberal uh, kind of triumphalism in the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, the left kind of went into retreat during this period. But starting in the late 1990s and early noughties, you had this emergence of the pink tide. So this new Latin American left, probably starting in the late 1990s, the election of Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela, but then you have people like Rafael Correa, the Kirchners in Argentina and so on. These, 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 uh, the, these political parties and social movements, which pursued, uh, pursued change and which you adopted a lot of the discourse and, and the kind of rhetoric of, of the traditional Latin American left, the kind of revolutionary Latin American left, but they pursued a policy of reform and they pursued power through the democratic process, through forming political parties, often political parties that, that claim to represent wider social movements and carried out uh, left reforms, often constitutional reforms, which redefined citizenship. And so in this context, Evo Morales, and the movement for socialism were elected in 2006. And a thing to understand, an important thing to understand about Bolivia is it's a country where the majority population is of indigenous ancestry. And uh, at least according to some, set, some historic censuses, the overwhelming majority of the population self-identify self as indigenous. Uh, and yet the country has throughout uh, its entire colonial and post-colonial history really been dominated by a small urban westernized elite who are predominantly of European descent or, or mixed race, what's called mestizo uh, in Latin America. Uh, and so the, the, the election of Evo Morales, who was a social movement leader, he came from this area called the Chapari and uh, is of Aymara indigenous ancestry. Was, was marked as this big important event in Bolivian history, particularly by the international press. He was hailed as the country's first indigenous president. Uh, and the movement for socialism and Morales promised to carry out a sort of revolutionary transformation of, the, of Bolivian society, something they refer to as the process of change. Uh, they promised to decolonize the Bolivian state and society to fundamentally change the colonial character of the Bolivian state and the wider Bolivian society and to recognize and represent the formerly marginalized indigenous majority population of Bolivia. However, in line with a lot of these other pink tide administrations in Latin America, it did this primarily through a process of constitutional and legal reform and attempts to redefine citizenship. Uh, alongside relatively limited redistribution of wealth through so-called conditional cash transfer programs, uh, through introducing things like a minimal state pension, which was called Rente Dignidad, increasing the minimum wage, and renegotiating the terms under which uh, international companies um, are, are granted permits to, to mine gas and petrochemicals uh, in, in, uh, in Bolivia, the Bolivian government was able to extract a greater proportion of this rent from petrochemicals and use this for infrastructure spending, particularly in formerly underrepresented uh, rural areas where you had rural indigenous peasantry. And so this process of change, it's sometimes referred to, this attempt to decolonize the Bolivian state and society is sometimes referred to as a democratic cultural revolution. The idea is that these formerly marginalized peoples who, who didn't really have a place in, in national life and not really recognized as part of the Bolivian nation, despite being the majority population of the country, should be formally recognized within a new plurinational state, a state whose constitution recognizes uh, the existence of multiple ethnic groups, multiple indigenous cultures, and which also 
is, is a very radical set of constitutional and legal reforms which which devolves power to indigenous communities. So uh, allows local indigenous communities to exercise their own forms of, of government, of kind of semi-autonomous government, uh, allows them to deal with matters according to their own customary law. So it, it, exercise, it affects what's sometimes called legal pluralism or de facto legal pluralism, allowing indigenous peoples to, to exercise their own forms of law and, and has a lot of very radical seeming uh, promises made in the constitution. So article nine of the Bolivian constitution claims that the aim of the Bolivian plurinational state is the decolonization of Bolivian society. Uh, and there are also things like the, um, the inclusion of indigenous principles within the constitution. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, in addition to this, uh, it's, it's quite sort of quite, quite uh, well known that the Patramama, the earth itself or the lived environment is recognized legally as a person with human rights within the Bolivian constitution. Uh, so this process of decolonization and the arrival of the movement, to social, uh, movement for socialism to power is sometimes referred to uh, popularly in Latin America as its second independence. So the first independence of Bolivia uh, in, the, in the early 19th century uh, meant that it was formally independent from the Spanish colony, but of course was run by a relatively tiny uh, European, culturally European elite, and the majority population in Bolivia, as is the case in other Latin American countries, which are of indigenous uh, or mixed race ancestry, the working class, people of, of African descent as well, in other parts of Latin America, were locked out of power and participation in national life. So with the arrival of the, of the movement for socialism, you have this coming of the second independence in this revolutionary transformation of Bolivian society. However, as I'm sure some of you may already be aware, uh, since the original election of Evo Morales and the, uh, the, and the mass government, it has suffered internal division but, uh, among some of the social constituencies and some of the social movement organizations which brought it to power. And following contested elections in 2019, there was essentially a military coup. Evo Morales was ousted from power, he had to leave the country. And there was a right-wing interim administration under a relatively minor right-wing political figure called Janine Añez. Uh, at, although this was uh, kind of a disastrous administration that happened, it was in power during the height of the COVID pandemic. And uh, only about a year later, the mass were re-elected in, in fresh elections. Uh, and now the mass are in power again. Uh, but under new president Luis Arce. But what I'd like to consider in this talk through my particular case study is why is it that this revolutionary project of social transformation has appeared to stall in Bolivia? Why has there been this internal division? And what does this say more generally about any attempt to decolonize the state or to decolonize wider society and the potential limitations of this sort of project? And uh, of course, this is important because uh, many countries in many parts of the world, not just in Latin America, have attempted to carry out similar uh, forms of constitutional and legal reform uh, that recognize the diverse ethnic and cultural groups that make up their societies. And this involves devolving power to communities, recognizing indigenous principles in law or the constitution, constitution and the plurality of law. But the question I'd like to think through in this talk is, to what extent can states and legal systems be decolonized? And what is the best way of achieving this? What do we mean by decolonization? Uh, how should the legacy of colonialism be addressed? And is this something which can be, can be addressed primarily through a project of state reform, of legal reforms? Or is it something which requires uh, a greater transformation of society beyond just the state? and also a conversation at the level of civil society about the legacies of colonialism and how to address them. So just to talk about the, the place where I did my field work, uh, this is known as Ailu Kirkiawi, uh, but it's also uh, recognized politically as a province within the Cochabamba department in Bolivia. And it's in fact the smallest and most remote province within Cochabamba uh, it's an area of about 150 square meters and it's inhabited by approximately 60 small villages uh, and the people that live in these villages, they are subsistence farmers and they live from the cultivation of tubers, pseudo cereals and from the pasture of animals such as 
of cameloid animals like llamas and sheep. Uh, however, historically, this community was considered to be an Ailu, and it's still referred to in these terms today. People still call it Ailu Kirkiawi, and there are historic documents dating back to the 16th century referring to it as Ailu Kirkiawi. Now, the concept of the Ailu is, a, is a rather, rather complicated, and I, I probably can't really do it justice in this short talk. It's been debated by uh, politicians and Andeanist scholars and, and anthropologists. But very briefly, it refers to a pre-colonial indigenous community and territorial organization that exists in the Andean region of the Americas in places like Western Bolivia and Southern Peru and uh, Southern Ecuador. Uh, and it's it has a number of distinguishing features. One of these is communal ownership of land. Uh, so whereas, while families have access to areas of land which they can inherit, this is a form of usufruct right. There is no commodity, uh, private ownership of land. It's all con contained in these communally managed fields known as Ionoka. Uh, and also there is a non-market economy. So the economic life within the Ailu is, is mainly carried out through forms of everyday reciprocity and also re reciprocal exchange, particularly forms of labor exchange uh, when it comes to periods of intense agricultural labor during certain parts of the year. Uh, another distinguishing feature of the Ailu is the, the existence of forms of local civic political authority, which are responsible for the management of these communal lands in which people live, the resolution of conflicts between different members of villages or communities, and uh, who are also ritual specialists. So they are responsible for carrying out rituals to the land, mediating the relationships between people and the environment that they inhabit. However, this community of Kirkiawi has a hybrid territorial and authority structure. So along with the Ailu and the traditional Ailu authorities, the Ailu uh, leaders, there also exists a peasant union and a municipal government. And I'll, I'll go on to uh, describe this in some more detail shortly. But just to locate my field site for you in Latin America, here is Bolivia. And within Bolivia, you can see the Department of Cochabamba in the center of uh, Bolivia. It's the, the central of the nine departments of Bolivia. And you can see um, Bolivar province or Kirkiawi is this little, little area in the corner. So it's about 150 square miles. And it's uh, populated by about 7,000 people who live in about 60 of these villages known as comunidades. Uh, so the structure of local government is outlined here in this organogram, and I don't mean to confuse you with this organogram, but basically what this shows is that there are three different overlapping forms of local government in Kirkiawi, and that these exist in parallel at different levels or different scales. So in the local village or comunidad, you have both an Ailu authority known as a Hilanku and a Dirigente, a peasant union leader. So you shouldn't be confused by the use of the term union, peasant union uh, or sindicato campesino is something which exists throughout uh, the Latin America and the Spanish speaking world. It's a, a form of local civic government, basically, uh, which in Bolivia has existed since at least the early 1950s. So in the local villages in Kirkiawi, there exists this sort of form of direct democracy, I think you could, you could call it. It's sometimes referred to as assembleic democracy. There's a sort of communal meeting space, a sede sindical in the village, and at least on a monthly basis, every member of the community will meet in this commun communal meeting space and discuss matters which pertain to the community. So whether people want to uh, to use land for certain purposes, conflicts which may exist between people, local development projects, for example. Um, all of these things will be discussed and they'll be discussed uh, until there is collective assent reached. So you don't have formal voting in a ballot. Uh, people will just go to this communal assembly hall and they'll go there typically in the morning. They'll stay there for lunch and they might stay till late in the evening for 12 or 13 hours. People will take their children, people will take their animals with them and they will just argue over these points until everybody has, has reached an agreement. Um, so this is a sort of form of, of quite kind of radical direct democracy, which is characteristic of rural communities in the Andes. And so the Hilanku and the Dirigente, they work alongside each other. They're kind of each other's 
uh, counterpart, and yet they are responsible for slightly different things. So the Hilanka is typically responsible for overseeing the communal management of this communally owned land within the Ailu communities, and the Dirigente may have similar functions and will consult with the Hilanku, but more typically is a sort of external mediator with NGOs, government agencies, the local and national governments and so on. Uh, so they, they are perceived as having slightly different roles. And then as you go up through these different levels within, uh, within the community of Kirikiawi, you have constellations of villages, larger areas, uh, you have higher levels of authority all the way up to the, the whole Ailu, where the leader is called the Malku, the traditional authority. And then you have the Tata Provincial or, or the, uh, the, the le level of the, the leader of the central, the provincial level peasant union leader. Now, since the 1990s in, in, in this region, as is, has happened throughout Bolivia, there is a local municipal government. And this government has, an elected, uh, has five elected councillors and a mayor and is responsible for managing the local budget uh, for development projects, which are carried out in, uh, uh, carried out within the community, within the 60 different villages of the community of Kirkiawi. And there is also a, an, a general um, assembly of the different social organizations of the ILU and the Peasant Union uh, and other social organizations within uh, the, the whole of the province, the whole of Kirkiawi, which meets on a bi-monthly basis. And so, Within the five-person municipal council, there are representatives both of the peasant union and of the ILU. So the peasant union is represented by uh, local councillors who stand under the Movement for Socialism, they're members of the Movement for Socialism uh, 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 party, whereas the ILU has its own, what's, what's referred to as a political instrument, which is called pogoi. This is a word in Quechua, in the, in the local Quechua language, which means flourishing. And so for uh, the last 20 years, there has always been, uh, rep there have always been representatives of both the ILU and the Peasant Union and the local government. So these different forms of local political authority, although some of them are pre-colonial, some of them are post-colonial, uh, they have different histories, they overlap and are seen to kind of integrate into one uh, more or less coherent whole within this community. And uh, again, I don't want to confuse people too much with these maps, but you can see here that there are also, as well as different authority or uh, political authority structures, there are different understandings of territory or space. So this is the area of, of Kirkiawi or Bolivar province divided up into cantons. So cantons are a colonial uh, division of, of territory. And you can see these red dots. These are the places where you have the union subcentral. So these are these are higher level uh, union uh, 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 authorities which are in charge of a constellation of different villages. And so you can see here the same territory as it is conceived according to the logic of the ILU. So it's not divided up into the same way, in the same way and it's divided up into these 10 areas which are called happies. And it's not actually shown on the map. Each happy is actually the area which surrounds a mountain, a mountain peak. Uh, because each of these constellations of villages is seen to be within the happy, the reach of this mountain. And the, the traditional authority that is in charge of this area of the Ailu, of the, uh, of the happy, uh, is in fact, uh, he, he's, he's given the name of the mountain peak of that area. And so he's referred to by that name when people hold meetings of the Ailu and they speak with each other. So as you can see, Although there is a kind of overlap and integration between these different forms of authority, they also have different understandings of the division of, of space and territory as well. So, um, I'd like to sort, of, to sort of talk now about how is it historically that this, this, this particular hybrid form of local civic politics has come about within this community. And this owes, is owed to the long relationship between this community and the colonial and post-colonial states of the last 500 years. And of course, in the kind of Western imagination, indigenous peoples have always been conceived as being outside of or on the frontiers of the state. So those of you who are familiar with classic political thought, you know, with the ideas of Thomas Hobbes or John Locke or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
will know that they often make reference to this sort of imagined indigenous person who is conceived of as existing outside of or on the frontiers of the state, uh, which is the sort of counterpart of the modern political subject that exists within a state. Uh, and so it's kind of necessary actually for this kind of uh, enlightenment modernity sort of self-conception uh, 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 that, that people had for there to be this imagined indigenous person, whether it's the sort of imagined indigenous community described by Thomas Hobbes, where people live in this kind of barbaric state of nature, or it's the noble savage described by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. However, anybody that's actually worked with indigenous communities, particularly in Latin America, will know that this is actually a load of nonsense, that indigenous peoples have always uh, been uh, engaged with the state, uh, and that they have a long history with European colonial and post-colonial states, and that they have actually shaped the nature of these states, and also they have been shaped by this interaction with the state as well. And so this is what has happened with this community of Kirkiawi. And so for the sake of brevity, we can divide the history of Bolivian indigenous state relations into these discrete periods. So the kind of pre-conquest period, the period of the Spanish colony, uh, the period of the Bolivian Republic, uh, then the period which came after a national revolution in the 1950s, then this sort of neoliberal period, which I alluded to briefly earlier, and finally the, the present period, which is sometimes referred to as the post-neoliberal period. Uh, so as, as I'm sure some of you are already aware, the territory of Bolivia has been inhabited for many millennia, we're not sure for how long, at least 12 or 15,000 years, and also the western half of Bolivia, uh, and as with other parts of the Andes and Mesoamerica and other parts of Latin America, was inhabited by these complex uh, kingdoms or state-like political formations, uh, notably in, in western Bolivia, the Aymara kingdoms and the Inca state. And it's understood by archaeologists, archaeologists and ethno-historians that the ILU, this form of local political organization, which still exists in some form today, was a constituent part, a sort of a basic kind of unit that made up the Aymara kingdoms and the Inca state. Uh, this local form of territory based on particular understandings of the communal ownership of land, particular relationships between people and nature, uh, and particular forms of local political authority. Um, now the Spanish, uh, when, they, when they came to places like Peru or Bolivia, they simply kind of inherited the, the kind of mantle of the previous uh, states or kingdoms which they conquered. Uh, they exploited the existing indigenous population and they basically carried out um, a form of indirect rule where they would tax local populations uh, and they would also uh, use forms of corvée labour, so they would uh, make use of, of native labour, whilst leaving the local, uh, some local uh, forms of territory and political structures intact. Uh, and so this is the case with communities like Kirkiawi, which remained internally organized as ILUs and they had their own internal customs. And these are referred to as usos y costumbres, the traditional forms of internal custom which existed within these local indigenous societies throughout the period of, uh, of the Spanish conquest and the Spanish colony. However, when you, with uh, colonial independence in the 19th century, the, the new post-colonial elite who were themselves westernized, uh, you know, very often European educated and uh, of, of Spanish or European ancestry or, or mixed race, found it difficult to come to terms with the fact that they wanted to be, to be a considered a modern nation. <coughs> they wanted to believe, believe to become a sort of modern liberal nation state. And yet the reality of Bolivia and as was the case with many other Latin American nations was that the overwhelming majority of the population were, uh, were, were not uh, modern Western European political subjects, they were indigenous peoples. And the, the whole kind of order of the colonial and post-colonial economy kind of de depended to an extent on their labor and the taxation of these indigenous communities. Yet starting in the late 19th century, liberal reformers in Bolivia tried to carry out a series of land reforms which threatened the independence and existence of these sorts of indigenous communities that I've described, places in 
like Kirkiawi, places in the sort of uh, Western Bolivian highlands. And so uh, these reforms attempted to expropriate indigenous lands, and the idea was to create a modern market, a capitalist market in lands, and to create a, 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 a peasantry, more like a, a European peasantry of just peasant smallholders, breaking up these kind of large territories uh, with their, their own kind of internal systems of ownership and management of land. And indigenous communities like Kirkiawi uh, and their leaders organized to protect their lands and their ways of life through both legal and extra legal means. So uh, by extra legal means, I refer to in the 19th and early 20th centuries, a series of uprisings by indigenous peoples, um, which, which were carried out. Uh, against these, these reforms and attempts to appropriate their lands, but also legal means uh, included the use of documents and legal proceedings uh, in order to defend their rights to occupy these lands and to defend their traditional custom, their usos y costumbres. So it was often the case that, that indigenous leaders, the leaders of these sorts of ILU communities would have 16th century colonial documents, which would be on sheepskin, which uh, showed that they, they owned land or part of the land which they occupied. And even though some of these individuals were just monoling they were monolingual Quechua speakers who couldn't actually read in Spanish, they would carry out complicated legal proceedings to try to defend by legal means their, uh, their right to inhabit these territories. And so this, this period of the kind of 19th and early 20th century in Bolivia saw the movement of the center of the economy in Bolivia away from the mining of, the, of silver towards the mining of tin. Uh, but it was still very much uh, an extractive mining based economy. And this is something which has been part of the history of Bolivia from the time of the, the, the colonization of Bolivia, um, right through the post, -col post colony in the 20th century, that it has been historically very poor, uh, but incredibly resource rich. So Bolivia is sometimes referred to as a beggar on a throne of gold, um, given that it is this historically kind of exploited, resource rich, but poor, uh, impoverished country. And during this period, there was a very small elite centered around the mining economy referred to as the Rosca. And uh, partly as a result of kind of disillusionment by the, with the urban middle classes, with this, this mining elite and a disastrous war uh, in the Chaco with Paraguay, the urban middle classes were radicalized in the uh, kind of 1940s, and this contributed to a momentous revolution which took place in Bolivia in 1952. And so this revolution in 1952 was protagonized by the miners, so Bolivia is famous for having incredibly militant and sort of Marxist inspired uh, uh, sort of miners movement and also by the peasantry. So people uh, in, in communities like Kirkiawi, where, which, I, which I studied, where I, I spent time, uh, but also who were in these landed estates known as haciendas, who were people also of indigenous ancestry, uh, but who had, had they, they, they didn't have ownership of their own lands. They, they lived in these haciendas in a sort of state of semi-feudal, kind of quasi-feudal serfdom this system in, in Bolivia that's referred to as Ponguaje. And uh, so this popular revolution protagonized by the miners and the peasantry overthrew the government uh, and, and led to the installation of the MNR, the, uh, the Movimiento Nacionalista Revolucionario, the National Revolutionary Movement government. Um, but the leadership really of the National Revolution was taken over by white and mestizo urban middle-class intellectuals. Uh, but it, represents a, a really fundamental shift in the nature of Bolivian society. It led to the nationalization of the mines, agrarian reform. So these big landed estates were broken up and it, it uh, created for the first time in Bolivia, a sort of peasant uh, smallholder class. Uh, and there was also this idea really of including the formerly completely excluded and marginalized indigenous peasantry into the modern nation. Um, so both through land reform, so creating peasant smallholders and a kind of small market uh, for land, but also through, through getting rid of the literacy requirements uh, 
uh, in the franchise, so effectively creating a universal franchise in Bolivia, voting rights for the first time for the majority of the population and mass education. And so part of the idea of this mass education was that everybody should learn to speak Spanish and that this would create a mestizo nation. So it would create a, a culturally and ethnically mixed nation. And this was the way that Bolivia would become gradually more modern um, through this process of sort of mestizoization. And importantly, it was during the National Revolution that these peasant unions as a form of local government were established throughout the countryside in Bolivia. And this was because uh, mine workers who were themselves very often uh, Quechua, of Quechua indigenous ancestry and bilingual Quechua speakers, but also who had gained an education, were literate, were influenced by um, by kind of uh, Marxist ideas or kind of left ideas, they, uh, they encouraged the creation of these peasant unions in the countryside. And the national government saw peasant unions as a way of bringing indigenous peoples into the modern nation and as a sort of a, a way of mediating between communities and the government. And so they encouraged the creation of peasant unions. And so in some communities like Kirkiawi, you would have still had the traditional authorities, the Ilo authorities, but then they would have gained this counterpart in the peasant unions. Now, uh, during this period, uh, although you had universal franchise, um, the, th there was a sort of, it was kind of characterized by a kind of political clientelism which existed uh, between very often the indigenous peasantry and national governments um, through the 50s and 60s. Uh, so the, the peasant unions would often encourage people, tell their members basically to vote all at one particular way for a particular political party in exchange for um, certain sort of favors, for example, small scale local development projects being granted to the community and so on. And so the Bolivian left, whilst being incredibly militant during this time, uh, was led by miners and urban revolutionaries. And the indigenous peasantry was seen really as being um, kind of out counter-revolutionary, kind of essentially a conservative force in Bolivian society. Now, following a period of dictatorship in the 1970s, the return to democracy uh, in, in 1982, the Bolivian governments uh, throughout this period carried out these so-called structural adjustment policies of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. So this consisted of massive uh, cuts to public funds, um, the, uh, 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 the, the liquidation of formerly nationalized industries such as Comibol, the nationalized mining company uh, in, in, in Bolivia. And this was a period of historic defeat for the left in Bolivia as it was in many parts of the world. But at the same time as you had this neoliberal reform during the 80s and through the 1990s, this was accompanied by what's sometimes referred to as multicultural, uh, sorry, neoliberal multiculturalism. So uh, governments like the government of Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada in the early to mid 1990s introduced reforms which devolved power to local communities, including indigenous peasant communities, and also recognized certain indigenous rights. Now, um, whilst this um, gave some recognition to indigenous peoples, it came at the cost of the rollback of the state and the destruction of a lot of, of, a lot of positive social rights. And a lot of this was inspired by um, a kind of attempt to carry out the goals of, of good governance, which were recommended by the World Bank and other multilateral agencies. So one of these, uh, there were basically two important laws which were, which were passed during this period, these kind of so-called um, neoliberal multicultural reforms. And one of them was a, a popular participation law. And this law devolved local power, to, power to local communities. It created these small scale local municipal governments. So this is how Kirkiawi gained its local municipal government, and it gave very small amounts of money to these municipal, municipal governments to carry out development programs. And so this meant that in Kirkiawi, the local peasant union gained this new role in being the mediator with the local municipal government for development funds and for carrying out development projects in these rural villages. And at the same time, you had the so-called INRA law, which was a law which allowed indigenous communities to gain a collective titling of ancestral lands. And so the traditional Ilu authorities within Kirkiawi carried out this, this project of, of mapping out 
their collective lands, collecting documents and, uh, and, and proving to, the, to INRA, to this um, Agricultural Reform Institution, uh, that uh, Agrarian Reform Institution, that they had a, a, an ancestral land that could be recognised as such. And so they gained the, the titling of the land of the Ailu as a what's called a, 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 a tierra comunitaria de origen, so like a, um, uh, sort of a, a, an originary peasant uh, territory. And um, this was a, a period of time which saw during 2000, 2005, a series of near revolutionary uprisings against the kind of excesses of this uh, uh, neoliberal government uh, at the time. And so people may be familiar with the 2000 water war, which uh, uh, which took place in Cochabamba, Bolivia. So this was when uh, the entire water system of the city of Cochabamba was privatized. It was sold off to a multinational conglomerate called Bechtel, who then hiked the prices of the water throughout Cochabamba and led to this massive protest because it meant that poor people, uh, at the time, I think the, the average wage um, it, uh, the average wage for somebody who lived in a poor neighborhood in South of Cochabamba was two US dollars a day. Um, and people simply couldn't afford to pay uh, the, the price of the hike of, the, of water that had been carried out because of this privatization. Um, and so the government backed down on this privatization and it led to a kind of period of rolling mass political protests and political instability. A few years, years later, another big event happened in the city of La Paz called the so-called gas war. Uh, which was about the decision um, to, uh, to export uh, uh, very cheaply the uh, uh, national gas. Um, and this, during this period of political instability, there was no sort of clear way out, basically, um, because a political force hadn't emerged to, uh, to kind of take, take charge of, uh, uh, of, of the Bolivian government and to sort of establish uh, some degree of political stability. And so into this, this void really stepped the movement for socialism and President Evo Morales, who represent a diverse array of different social movements and social constituencies that all came together during this period uh, and formed this kind of nat national pact, what's sometimes referred to as the Pact of Unity, um, and it's provided stability, investment, and quite a high degree of poverty reduction. Um, and, and also, as I, I've said earlier, you know, this very, uh, very radical seeming reform of the state in this project of decolonizing Bolivian society. Uh, and yet it has also intensified mining activity and foreign ownership, and it has not fundamentally changed the nature of the Bolivian economy, which is based on extractive industry, nor has it fundamentally challenged the power of local capitalist elites or multinational uh, capitalist enterprises. Uh, and it passed a, a new plurinational uh, constitution in 2009, which included some of these very radical claims about decolonization and embodying indigenous principles and so on. And yet conflict and internal division has emerged amongst indigenous groups and the breakdown of the Pact of Unity. And it was also during this period when, when I carried out my field work uh, that division had emerged between the different forms of local political authority in Kirkiawi. And so much of my research and much of the, what I've written so far has examined the interaction between these state reforms and local communities in Bolivia, reforms which ostensibly progressive reforms attempt to represent, to include Bolivia's previously marginalized indigenous majority population, but which in the case of Kirikiawi have actually led to conflict, have helped to stoke conflict between its different forms of local political authority. And so one of the issues which divided these different authorities, uh, the, uh, the ILU and the Peasant Union concerns the issue of indigenous autonomy. So a new law in Bolivia, and in fact the constitution, um, grants the right to indigenous communities to become uh, autonomous territories with their own traditional forms of government. Uh, and yet the island peasant union in Kirki are, Kirkiawi argue over how this should be carried out. And they argue over the exact nature of the forms of local government, which should be uh, formalized as part of this new indigenous uh, autonomy. And this struggle for power, it's a, uh, it reflects contested understandings of the nature of governance, so how government should be carried out, whether it should be carried out on the basis of uh, these 
these kind of principles which the ILO uh, authorities talk about of re re rotation of leadership, for example, um, this, this concept that they call muyo, which means that no one person should remain in power for, for, for any great deal of time, that, that authority should be um, distributed amongst different families and within the community, uh, or whether it should be carried out on the basis of more kind of formal Western liberal democratic understandings of governance, such as popular votes. Um, which, which are more embodied really by the forms of democracy of the peasant union. They also uh, disagree with each other about understandings of how development should be carried out within their community and what development means. Uh, so how this uh, uh, increase in, in, in extraction of rent and distribution of money to local communities should actually be invested in development projects um, and the the ILU leaders who have ties to wider indigenous rights organizations in Bolivia, national and international indigenous rights organizations, are much more concerned about the effects of extractive industry on the environment, but also on other indigenous communities who are affected by mining and other forms of extractive industry, uh, including lowland indigenous people, so people who are in the eastern lowland tropical area of Bolivia. So another issue which divided these local authorities concerned a land dispute between families which had resulted in grave physical fights. Now new laws and the constitution in Bolivia permit indigenous communities to, uh, to deal with criminal matters to resolve internal conflicts according to their customary law. Yet in this case the authorities, the ILU and the Peasant Union, argue with each other over which of them has the right to judge this matter according to the constitution and the precise meaning of their customary law. So we have an example here of a law which, while seemingly progressive, which attempts to empower indigenous peoples, actually provides the motive for conflict within one indigenous community. And this ultimately illustrates the difficulties involved in making the state accommodate itself to the complex forms of social life of local communities. Meanwhile, whilst I carried out field work in uh, peri-urban neighbourhoods of the nearby city of Cochabamba, I witnessed how uh, very often rural urban migrants, uh, Quechua speaking, Aymara speaking indigenous peoples, uh, were marginalised. Their lives were rendered informal by various socio-legal processes, um, which, uh, which, which the, 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 the government, despite being seemingly progressive, didn't really do anything to address. Um, so there's various examples of, of this, but one very obvious one was that rural urban migrants often lack official title deeds for their physical dwellings. And so this means that they are not formally recognized as belonging to the city. They're not essentially uh, recognized as full citizens. They don't have access to the same rights and, social, uh, and uh, public services. And they have to pass through an arduous legal process in order to gain formal uh, ownership of their dwellings. So people's relationship with the state is not one of abandonment, it's rather what I describe as a present absence, because the state places demands on the lives of indigenous rural urban migrants, but it doesn't actually respond uh, to, to, um, to provide them with positive social rights. And this is important um, as well, because I witnessed uh, during my period of, of fieldwork how urban indigenous residents in, in places like Cochabamba were frequently victims of crime. Now, while new laws in, in Bolivia permit indigenous communities in the countryside to deal with criminal matters according to customary law, attempts to impose what is referred to as communitarian justice are frequently viewed as barbaric vigilantism. And this is something which is compounded by the racialized othering of urban indigenous residents by the predominantly white and mestizo mixed race inhabitants of the city. And so ultimately this illustrates the ambiguity of the new constitution in providing rights to indigenous people, uh, in defining what's understood by indigeneity. And it's important to point out that um, the majority of indigenous people in Bolivia are, don't live in the countryside, they live in the city. So they live in peri-urban neighborhoods um, in places like Cochabamba, in places like La Paz or in El Alto, which is an enormous satellite city, which is actually the, now the largest city in Bolivia and is almost entirely populated by Aymara 
speaking Indigenous peoples. Uh, and yet the way that these forms of legal recognition and autonomy work is they very much assume that Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities are not urban, they, they exist in the countryside. Um, partly because what's understood by indigeneity or to be Indigenous is influenced by Western understandings of indigeneity, which are enshrined in international human rights law. And so this ultimately demonstrates the problems involved in accommodating cultural difference through these sorts of uh, projects of state reform and legal recognition. So, so just to conclude, the mass government has attempted to establish a new inclusive plurinational state. Uh, it has attempted to uh, formally recognize the diverse groups of indigenous peoples that make up the Bolivian nation and to uh, address the legacies of colonialism through doing this, to, to fundamentally change the nature of the Bolivian state, uh, to allow it to formally uh, recognize indigenous peoples, to include them, to, to provide power to them through various forms of legal, re legal reform recognition. And yet this has had paradoxical outcomes and it fails to accommodate the state to the local, the complex realities of local social life. It ultimately demonstrates the limitations of providing inclusion and recognition through a process of legal reform. So um, just in the final 10 minutes, I, I just like to use this space to kind of reflect on what this says more generally about the nature of the state or what the, the nature of the state, as we can uh, conceive of it, um, says about the limitations of these sorts of uh, projects of reform. So as people in RAG are very aware, anthropologists have engaged in interdisciplinary de uh, debates about the nature of states and state power. Um, so the recent book by um, the two Davids, which is very controversial, I know in, in RAG, talks about this a lot. So what is the state essentially and how is it that states are able to effectively govern populations? Now, this is an extremely complicated theoretical topic in social science, but at least since the time of Weber, we've understood states as forms of centralised bureaucratic governance that monopolise coercive power. So in other words, states control a particular territory and they do this through monopolising the use of force or violence, but they are also a form of bureaucratic governance. So states are able to effectively govern populations because they collect information about them and they use this information to govern them for a lot of the the central functions of states such as collecting taxation, managing uprisings, uh, establishing public order and so on. Now an important political scientist and anthropologist called James Scott has argued that in order to do this uh, states create these simplified maps of the populations which they attempt to govern. And uh, much like, like maps, these, uh, these simplified uh, schema of the societies they attempt to govern only include the most important kind of schematic information uh, about these communities. Now, more importantly than this, what Scott argues and other uh, political scientists have argued is that in doing this, um, local communities are actually made to fit the simplifying schema of state planners. Um, so not only do they, they come up with these kind of these schema, these ways of representing societies to govern them, they actually make societies more like the simplified schema which they use. So what do I mean by this? So um, a very sort of quick example of this is uh, I have here is uh, uh, of two maps of a Russian village before and after a land reform. Uh, which brought about the uh, private ownership of land. So you can see that in the left hand side before this land reform was established that the areas of arable land which families used to cultivate crops were divided up into these many many tiny little strips. Um, uh, so it's very difficult to establish who owns what bit of land and there are also areas of, of communal land which are for things like collecting firewood or for the pasture of animals and so on. And on the right hand side, after this land reform, the area of land of the village has simply been divided up into more or less equal uh, areas for each of the families. Now, from the perspective of the centralized state bureaucracy, this is much simpler for the purposes of taxation, for the purposes of, uh, of, of registering property, inheritance and so forth. But in, in making this change to the nature of ownership to make the community and its understanding of territory and space 
uh, its understanding of ownership more like this simplifying model, this map, this fundamentally alters the nature of local social life. So in this sense, we can see societies as, uh, as, as like complex ecosystems. And we can also see the, manage the governance of societies uh, by states as like the management of ecosystems, or the management of forests. So in these two pictures, you have on the left hand side, uh, a forest which is uh, with a dense thicket of undergrowth, many different trees close together and so on. And on the right hand side, a forest which has been managed according to the principles of modern scientific forestry. There is no undergrowth, the undergrowth has been cleared, the trees are placed in neat rows, and this means that the forest can be more efficiently managed in order to harvest lumber, to harvest wood, uh, but at the same time the, the complex ecosystem of the forest has been simplified and it is, is in fact more vulnerable to soil erosion and to various forms of disease. So in this same way uh, we can see societies as, as complex ecosystems. They uh, are, are things we can't really understand in all of their complex messy totality and yet nonetheless they have forms of local custom, social life, which allow them to function and also make people's lives meaningful. And here we can see in this idea of legibility and the nature, the, the, the simplifying nature of, of, uh, of, of states that try to render populations that they govern legible, the kind of central paradox of modern states. So we rely on states nowadays for the, the guarantee of many of our fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, we, we see them as responsible for doing things like managing public health, as we've seen during the pandemic. And yet at the same time, states limit our freedoms and they also limit the expression of local forms of social life and identity through trying to make communities fit within their simplifying schema. So what does this say about these sorts of projects of decolonization or inclusion of marginalized social groups? Uh, through, through state reforms, through state reforms and forms of legal recognition. Well, what this suggests is that these sorts of projects of decolonization, like the one carried out by the Movement for Socialism, produce legible political subjects. So in order to provide rights and recognitions to previously marginalized peoples, they need to be legible to the state. They need to be recognizable according to categories of identity. They have to be included within a state schema. And this is ultimately based on what's sometimes referred to as the politics of recognition. So legal categories are created through liberal states to which to provide rights to marginalized social groups. And yet, as we've seen in this, this case study, legal recognitions fail to adequately capture the complexity of local forms of social life and identity. Uh, they often leave some individuals or communities out, or they make these communities fit their models of how they recognize their identity. So in the, the case of indigenous peoples and indigenous rights recognized through legal reforms, very often there's a particular understanding of indigeneity, which is a homogenous understanding of indigeneity. It's a Western uh, understanding of indigeneity, which goes back to sort of ideas of Rousseau and the noble savage and so on. And the reality of indigenous communities is that they are far more complex, mul uh, um, uh, uh, multivalent, um, and often have various different conflicting understandings of identity, different forms of local uh, community, different forms of local political authority and so on. Uh, and so these legal uh, forms of recognition do not adequately capture this, but they also can lead to conflict between different local uh, figures within the local community, as was the case with Kirkiawi, conflict between its different forms of local political authority. Um, and so I think it can be said that the Ailu and Union authorities uh, within Kirkiawi, although they existed together um, and are seen in a sense as a counterpart, each other's counterpart, they embody somewhat different commonly held aspirations of their community and other indigenous communities uh, in Bolivia and in the Americas. So the, 
the peasant union fundamentally because of its sort of history in the national revolution in the 1950s and the role that it's taken on. Uh, figures who are involved with the politics of the peasant union are very much trying to gain inclusion for indigenous peoples within the mainstream of Bolivian society and national life and inclusion within and control over the liberal state. Um, and this is something which which it, a, a goal that Indigenous peoples all kind of share. It's a kind of common aspiration of a very marginalised, impoverished social group. And on the other hand, the Ailu leaders, because of the projects that they've been involved in, because of their longer history, uh, are more concerned with protection of local autonomy and local custom, their usos y costumbres. And there's a much longer history of political activism and advocacy by the leaders of Ailu communities to try to protect their territories and try to protect their ways of life against this modernization by the liberal state. And uh, whilst these two different aspirations can sometimes go together, sometimes they pull in different directions. Uh, and it, ironically, it's been the reforms of the movement for socialism. So these reforms like uh, indigenous autonomy reforms, which allow the formal recognition of indigenous forms of local government or legal pluralism that actually brought the different authorities into conflict with each other. Uh, and this is because they have to, in order to be eligible for these rights, to be recognized by the states, make their local forms of social life and identity legible to the state. And in doing that, uh, this means that they have to very often make their community simplified. They have to make it fit into a more simplified view of the community that has, for example, one local form of civic political authority. Um, there isn't really anything in any of these laws which assumes that there might be multiple forms of civic political authority, even though this is the case in indigenous communities. Uh, and so it's during this period of, of seemingly very radical reform in Bolivia uh, that this conflict has emerged within this community. And so this, I, I'd like to conclude by suggesting that this, um, suggests a kind of limitation of these sorts of projects of reform, these attempts at, uh, at what's sometimes called decolonization, so the attempt to address the legacies of colonialism in post-colonial societies. And the demands of marginalized groups are not just about recognition very often by the state, but about the transformation of social structures beyond the state. So in Latin America, in Bolivia, social uh, indigenous social movement organizations are often concerned with things like land reform, things which challenge local economic elites and so on. And these are demands which go beyond simply simple formal recognition and kind of democratic constitutional changes. And uh, social life and political projects of, of groups are often more complex than formal identity categories can adequately capture. And ultimately, uh, any attempt to try to accommodate states to forms of local community, to, to accommodate states to the, the forms of life, for example, of indigenous communities in a country like Bolivia, which are just based on top-down processes of constitutional reform, will fail to accommodate the state to the forms of life of local communities. So any real kind of process of decolonization has to be not just a kind of top-down process of reform, it has to be based on understanding and recognizing the often very complex forms of social life, the complex forms of um, legal authority and political authority within local communities um, so that there can be an accommodation between them and the state. Uh, so I think I've come in in a, just about an hour and uh, I hope we'll have some room for questions. So I'll leave it there. Please. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, can, shall we have the screen back so we can... Hmm. Let me just stop sharing. See each other again. Can we stop share screen? I think I've stopped sharing. Yeah, I think it moved. Yeah, that, that would be great. great. Brilliant. Have we got, we've got quite a few people. Yeah, a few interesting comments in the chat, particularly from Mark. I don't know if you'd like to come in on some of that, Mark, um, compa comparing some of his experience in Nicaragua. Um, yeah, that was a very, very interesting 
expose of the kind of different directions that were being pulled of these different layers of, of involvement of indigenous people through the history. That was a really excellent um, uh, uh, expose of that. Um, how, do we have any comments or questions for, um, for Matthew? Um, we've got some people here who have good knowledge of. <laughs> I see of Denise the Arnold Bolivian is Revolution. there and Mark Jake Young. So I'm sure there's people. Denise Arif is here. Uh, Mark has a lot of comp uh, comparisons with Nicaragua as well. Is anybody wanting to step up and, and ask some? Some of us more knowledge. Denise is volunteering, I think. Great. Okay. Um, well, very interesting talk, Matthew, and um, amazing to fit so much into one hour. Um, I think being fair to Evo Morales, he was ne he never had an indigenous um, ambition. He always saw himself as a union leader, and it was the international press that really put him on a pedestal as representing indigenous people. So. Um, you know, there are lots of misunderstandings from that very first period, and certainly the mass party had no interest in um, applying the political constitution, which was on the cards from a, a, an earlier period when they took government. Um, they wanted to undo it as quickly as they could, and they did it under Alvaro Garcia's um, supervision. Um, I think... Um, one of the very interesting things is that in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, a lot of um, NGOs and different world governments, the Danish and so on, financed the mapping of indigenous communities. And there was an enormous mapping of the islands right across the Altiplano. And um, it was so detailed that you had the emails and the names and addresses of all the Malkus <laughs> that it could be applied. But it was never done. It was just immediately abandoned by um, the mass party when they came to power. And um, I've never known, there's never been a debate about it, or I've never read an article. Maybe you, you know of some things about it, but it was very interesting. But the only other time I've seen when territory has been an issue during the war of the Ayus in the year 2000, um, it was Madeleine Albright, the American, North American Secretary of State, who came down and controlled the mapping. So um, it may have been controlled at a much higher level. Um, I think you'll find there are a number of points. Um, TOA has, has um, put a lot of attention into indigenous battles about land and custom in the Republican period onwards, but there's an enormous amount in the colonial period of the defense from the Derecho Indiano and, and playing with the Derecho Indiano in a very interesting way that goes right back. And the Apoderados, the, the people the, um, that manage the land titles going right back into that much earlier period. So it's not just a Republican um, battle. Um, and of course, participación popular, popular participation was never really directed at indigenous populations because it was a head count. So it, more money always went to the cities. And so what it did was unleashed a tremendous process of organization and the emptying of rural communities. And that may have been um, with a view of, of citizenship um, behind it, but of the kind of Mestizo citizenship that you're describing. Well, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much for that, Denise. Yeah, I mean, as, as you're right to say, of course, that Morales is sort of more considered an indigenous figure amongst the sort of international left commentaria than in Bolivia, where he's seen as a leader of the sort of uh, cocolero movement and a kind of union figure. Um, that's quite right. Um, yeah, does that, I, did, you, did you have any question uh, particularly or? Um, well, I, I just think that it's not just a matter of, um, you know, what do you think about the 
the representation of the plurinational state? Do you think there is an indigenous representation there? Because when I've tried to analyze it, I've only found like four to seven percent of any kind of indigenous representation in the parliament um, because it all goes through the political parties. So it can't really be described as a plurinational state. It is just a name and a discourse, isn't it? And, it's, and that means it's not just a problem at the lower level, it's a problem all the way up and down. Um, well, I, I suppose it's a compromise, isn't it? I mean, as you, you know, very well. I mean, the, the sort of the 2009 uh, constitution was a sort of compromise document between different members of social organizations. And also there was a sort of great deal of pressure from kind of elite, you know, kind of uh, local kind of capitalist elites, particularly in the sort of eastern kind of tropical lowlands like landowners and uh, in, in, in sort of San, place like Santa Cruz during that period. And so that document is really a kind of compromise that was worked out. Um, I, I mean, of people that I knew in, in Bolivia, I, some people who, who involved with organizations like Conamac, they had at that time, I think, a much more sort of ambitious and revolutionary view of what the constitution would be and what would be achieved by it. And um, what would be what they understood, for example, by things like indigenous autonomy. So the way that indigenous autonomy is carried out uh, in, in Bolivia, it's, it's not very different from the local municipal authorities that were created under the popular participation law in the 1990s it's essentially modeled on them so um indigenous autonomies are really just uh local municipal governments which which have some sort of formal recognition of indigenous custom um whereas i think some people during that period in the early as, as i understand it during the kind of early years of the mass had this vision that indigenous autonomy would would mean reconstructing the former koya suyo and the kind of you know the ilus of uh, of, of Koyasuyo and, and reconstructing this kind of uh, indigenous policy as, um, as through through a process of constitutional reform. But who in mass put that forward? Well, I, I just uh, people I know who are involved in Conamac, uh, but I'm, I'm not in, in mass, but who were members of the constituent assembly during the constituent assembly process. Yes. But I mean, I mean, my I mean, my understanding of the the mass is that it's a sort of um, a kind of hegemonic political party which stabilized uh, Bolivian politics in the mid noughties and which has had the effect really of actually kind of weakening um, social movement organizations by kind of co-opting them um, and uh, and also as you know kind of creating their own kind of official versions and so there are kind of parallel organizations of different uh, social movement organizations such as you know Conamac and CDOB that there's an official and an organic version of these organizations and, and also by um, by kind of co-opting social movement organizations by making politics a, a career where you can uh, you can get a job in the state administration and so politics and particularly unionism is seen seen differently because it, it becomes the, the the ladder to um, some sort of cushy job eventually uh, at the same time you know I don't want to be too critical of the mass but I think that um, they are you know, and the, the mass as a political party and the mass as in government has had the effect really of kind of stabilizing political uh, politics in Bolivia and limiting the ability of social movements to actually affect radical change. Arif has got his hand up. Arif, yes. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. That was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I do have. Hey, can we see you? Is that any chance we can see well, you? I'm, I'm a bit of a. I've just come back from the farm, so I'm a bit of a. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yes. Okay, come on. Uh, I, I, yeah, so I, have, I do have an interest in believer in Latin American politics um, more widely. And um, I, I wonder if you're being a, a bit harsh. I mean, this this push for autonomy is, is not going away. You know, we're going to see it. Um, I, hopefully, if 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 Petro wins in Colombia, we'll, we'll see pushes for it in Colombia. Um, we'll we'll you know hopefully see it also in um, Chile with the Mapuche um, and other you know. We'll, obviously, we're seeing it already in in Mexico, other parts of Latin America, you know, um, and it's seen by lots of social theorists as an an important step. Um, as you say, of decolonizing, of moving away from capitalism, um, and so on, and, and creating, you know, uh, 
um, a, a more communal, ecologically grounded society. Um, so, I mean, as you've, 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 you've talked about one particular um, autonomous um, community and the tensions there. Is this, is this, I guess that there are others in Bolivia, is this common to all, all of them? Um, could it all possibly be um, described as, um, you know, more, more like um, teething, you know, teething problems as opposed to like, as, as I think what you're describing is more fundamentally um, flawed processes um, that, that can't be resolved. So I, I think that, you know, it depends on the particular indigenous community. So in Bolivia, obviously, you have um, highland and lowland indigenous communities. And then you have, uh, you know, you, you have people who, uh, I mean, would would maybe self-identify as indigenous who live in the sort of uh, kind of, you know, valley regions, for example, or, or people who maybe are uh, sometimes called intercultural colonists, who are people who come from the mines or who come from, um, these kind of Quechua speaking indigenous communities, but they, they settle in um, tropes. So, you know, depending on what you mean by indigenous, but um, the it, amongst communities that have, have, have applied for indigenous autonomy, you have some where they, their, their local forms of civic political organization are just peasant unions. And so this is to do with the history of, of, of Bolivia, the Bolivian colony and post colony. So some areas of Bolivia retained these local forms of control of understanding of territory and local forms of political authority. Um, some, uh, some areas of Bolivia became part of these kind of landed estates and uh, then people became sort of peasant smallholders after the national revolution and so those parts, those, those communities just have peasant unions. Um, some, some have peasant unions and traditional island authorities side by side and in the lowland regions um, people have different forms of, of local political authority. So in every case where you've had uh, an application to become an indigenous autonomy under these, these, these new constitution, there's sort of different local conditions really, um, the, depending on the nature of the, the community. However, the, what I describe is not untypical. So there are other uh, anthropologists and political scientists that have studied the indigenous autonomy process and have found similar sorts of um, conflicts develop between different forms of local political authority or different communities. So a friend of mine called Jonathan Alderman, who, who studies this Kalawaya community in Bolivia, describes a sort of conflict which is between the peasant union and the Ailu. And the difference with the community that he studies is that some communities or clusters of villages within this community are represented by the peasant union and some are represented by the ILU authority, some are recognized as an ILU. Um, whereas in the community that I studied, actually there is an ILU authority, a Hilanku, and there's a Dirigente, a peasant union authority in every village and at different levels of at different scales throughout the community. So they're sort of perceived to exist in parallel as a sort of counterpart, com complementary um, to each other. Uh, and so, the the way that the indigenous autonomy process paid out, paid out and the kind of conflicts and tensions are different depending on the nature of the local community but i think that what what's in common with a lot of these um communities and has been described in by, by other people that have studied this process is that there is conflict there is tension um because you're having to make the community legible to the state in order to be recognized in order to be granted this uh, this this formal recognition of autonomy. So you have to have this um, draft a document where you decide as a community what are the forms of local government or administration and the values and so on of that community. And that's a decision which means that something which is often tacit, embodied, um, you know, it's it's not really kind of ever been put into words before necessarily, certainly never written down, has to be formalised, it has to be put into words. And in doing that, in making your the nature of your local community of forms of social life and identity legible to the state, this inevitably results in complex and tensions between different members of the community who might have different interests, or struggle over power, or just different understandings of what it means to belong to their community. Right. Chris, Chris, you want to go? Yes, Matthew, that was a wonderful um, 
mm. presentation. Very, very, very interesting. Um, I, and I, I agree with Denise that it's, it's remarkable how much ground you managed to cover in, in, in an hour. Um, I, I suppose it's inevitably covering so much it was at, at the expense of what might traditionally have been considered to be um, sort of anthropology in the sense you didn't get down to the nitty gritty of any sort of detailed interactions in the area where you're doing your field work. So I, my, my, I have a question which is, um, you, you were describing, I think, if I've got it right, that the traditional IU authorities, at least in terms of their ideals, um, it was very much about rotating authority, taking power, surrendering it, making sure that you, mm. power didn't get stuck in one particular place. Um, I mean, clearly, if you do keep rotating the authority and no one quite knows where it, where it was or where it might go next, that would make authority and the, and, the, and the political structure, as you put it, illegible to the state, therefore hugely difficult to control. But of course, for many of us, including, of course, Marxists, the ultimate goal is precisely to get rid of the state. I mean, we don't, the state isn't an ideal form of organization at all. So I, I, can you just perhaps describe how realistic that is? In other words, give us some flavor of this rotation and, and distribution of power. I, I, I think I caught, I, I, I've got it right when you sort of said that to many in the cities, what what is an ideal to the IU authorities might be considered very different. I mean, it, I mean, for example, in terms of um, uh, law and order and stuff. I mean, you, you was I, was it was you were saying that some of the some of the, if you leave crime detection and and, and and deterrence and sort of upholding kind of you know civilized behaviour to to those. It's perceived as, as you put it, I think, communi communitarian justice, in other words, vigil vigilantism. So, um, and, and I suppose, do you, would, I suppose my, it's, it's all very challenging and very interesting, but I, 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 I suppose, what would be the alternative to, to, to mass? I mean, could it be this IU kind of model? Could it be applied to the cities? And I mean, it seems to me, certainly in the, in the recent period, the alternative has been some right wing coup, as you were describing. That, of course, you know, for a, we had this little period where, the, where it turned out that indeed, as the left have always maintained, the traditional left, the trade union left, have always maintained. If you really let the the, the, the mass, you know, sort of collapse, what you're, you're not going to get anything better. You're going to get something a lot worse. So, I, but I, anyway, my main, I suppose, my main question is: Can you give us a little bit more? Can you flesh out a little bit what what this from your actual local fieldwork? What this um, what this model of the IU um, sort of pole of it or politics in terms of rotation of authority? How it how it works? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the uh, local hilanku, the, the local community, is basically sort of chosen by the community by kind of collective assent each year. And um, one of the ideas of um, this sort of system of authority is that you are you're kind of chosen by the community so you you're, you are you're not you don't kind of stand in a kind of formal election in order to be to become Hilanku you're kind of chosen because it seemed to be essentially your turn and also it's a kind of condition of um, community membership basically to to be involved in this sort of form of local civic politics so as I mentioned uh, it's very common, and I think as it's very common amongst rural communities in, in Bolivia, that people might actually live some of the time or predominantly in nearby cities, but they retain lands in their, their communities of origin. And these lands are held in these collective uh, areas of land called Ayanoka, so they, they don't have legal ownership of them. Um, they're essentially a form of usufruct right, and should you leave the community for a period of time, then this land can be redistributed based on need to other other communities, other other members of the community. So, in order to have access to the land, you have to basically go back to participate in uh, forms of local custom. You have to use the land. Um, you actually have to to work. You actually have to. To, to put it to productive use, but you also have to participate in this form of local civic politics. So if you're living in the city and you're asked to be the Hilanku, um, you might still have to return to for these monthly meetings um, 
uh, in order to to discuss kind of local issues with the kind of lo local members of the community in a communal assembly. Um, so it might be issues to do with, for example, uh, people arguing about the exact boundaries between their areas of land, people pasturing their animals in areas of animal land through particular parts of the year, um, investments in local forms of development projects and so on. Uh, and so it's it's not seen to, to, to occupy one of these roles in lo the lo sort of traditional forms of civic politics. Uh, it's it's not seen as a something that you aspire to um, to do it's seen as a sort of responsibility but in doing it you are able to develop as a person uh, and you are to kind of develop a greater degree of responsibility as a person as you move um through the through uh, through taking on this role and it sort of cycles through different families in the, in the community so in that sense it's it, it's rotates so no one uh person can hold on to the role it simply rotates amongst different members of the community as a kind of responsibility that has to be carried out um, to my ears, that sounds a lot closer to communism than all these various <laughs> state, you know, pink reforms which the, the, the kind of communists or Marxists have attempted to implement. But well, there's, there's a whole sort of tradition in um, sort of Bolivia and Peru of this sort of romantic kind of Marxism. Um, so there's a guy called Jose Carlos Maria Tegui, who's... Um, uh, Maria Tegui, sorry, who is... Uh, uh, who's a sort of Marxist uh, scholar, and that there's a sort of idea that the ILU is a sort of model for, for a communist society. Mm. Um, and so this is sort of popular kind of, kind of sort of romantic, romanticization basically of, of the ILU amongst people on the left in Latin America. And you're not persuaded by that? Um, well, I think that it's an example of communism in action. Or... Well, I mean, you're not persuaded that it's a model. Um, well, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know how 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 you would scale this up into a model for yeah, yeah, the sure. society, but it's it's also part of the discourse of contemporary social movements and also of, of the movement for socialism government. So um, even Evan Morales has said, you know, the ILU is the great moral resource on which the you know communitarian socialism will be built. Um, so that, but because the ILU is as as a form of territorial organization, as a form of community. Um, is based on non-market forms of it, of of, uh, of, of uh, economic um, uh, relationships, um, but also people are involved in market forms of activity as well. So it's not as if it's uh, or, you know, it, people are, people are in trade as they go to the city. People have business. Let's ask a like very that. a very quick mm -hmm. question, which is a kind of obvious one for anyone in in Rag. Is um th those monthly meetings? I mean, presumably if they're traditionally monthly, they would be lunar months. Luna, yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, they must have been. They must have been. <laughs> yeah. have but that make, only makes well, sense because there's more light in the sky. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that does make it all the more interesting because, um, you know, the idea of taking grass yeah. and distributing it on a monthly basis, if it's not man made colonial months, if it's proper months, would be, um, yeah, fascinating. I mean, for, for all of us in RAG, given that that's, we, we you know, our, our, our our model, of course, is that would be pretty close to where we where we started, where we became human and egalitarian and communistic in the first place. But anyway, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Matthew. It was great. Yeah, great. <clears throat> that was great. Um, are there? We we might have another question from somebody, or, or if Mark has any contribution, because he maybe he's too busy with the. Babysitting, um, any, anything? No more from anybody. If not, we're gonna um, <coughs> probably wind up with nearly eight o'clock. Is there saw, anybody I saw, else? I saw, yeah. Denise, I saw Denise disagreeing with something. <laughs> what? It's a little bit more complicated. Um, I mean. Even in the Hacienda communities, I've, I've visited the Hacienda communities and they have very, very good monthly meetings where the women have much more, <laughs> much more say than they do in the ILU communities, um, where the men tend to dominate the meetings about land because the women inherit animals and um, textiles. Okay. So, um, mm. you know, it's... 
And the trouble with the mass is that they now um, change those decisions so that they're voted by party and they're no longer voted as, you know, a no number of individuals that all come together in the IU and all vote together into a communal decision, which can take days to arrive there. It's a very fascinating process, as, as Matthew has said. Um, in the colonial period, um, there was a mixture of both the traditional non-rotating authorities and the rotating authorities. And it was the non-rotating authorities who were charged with the land, which went through the system still of nobles and blood. Um, because it was so important to, to control pasturing lands and agricultural lands. And they let the regidores and alcaldes and so on opt into the rotating system. Um, but there is a long history to how that those changes came about. Yes, I mean, of course, it's not as if this particular form of local civic politics and community is some sort of living fossil, which is as it was during the time of the Inca Empire or anything like that. It has a long history with the colonial state, which explained um, its present form. Um, absolutely. Well, thank you. I think if, if we've got any more contributions at all, but I, um, it's been an absolutely fascinating uh, uh, discussion um, and very revealing for a lot of us mm -hmm. um, who've, who've really kind of uh, not been perhaps following exactly what's been happening in terms of the indigenous politics. So this is really fascinating. Um, so thank you very much, Matthew. That was uh, really appreciated. Um, and um, thanks very much for the opportunity. I appreciate yeah. it. And um, we're going to look forward to to the book absolutely, and and hope we we'll wish you the very best of luck with the writing for that. Um, yeah, it, it would be a um, really great great read. And um, so, just to say to everybody that that this one is our last session before summer. We're going to take um, the rest of June, July, and August off. Um, um, we will definitely be back uh, Tuesday of the equinox, September. We should have programs ready by um, autumn, uh, by end of August or early September. So please do look out for those. And, and I hope that we'll be um, welcoming some people back. Uh, we will try and maintain the Zoom, although we're also going to try to get back live at UCL as well and generate that. Um, but thank you very much, Matthew, for, for a great talk. That was a really, really... Uh, Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.